They arrived early to stake out their territory with improvised barricades. By mid-morning, their numbers were swelling. Well, they're bringing up reinforcements and supplies up to where the police line is, just over there. Their objectives were twofold. First, to keep lawmakers out of the Legislative Council building to prevent the passage of the controversial extradition bill. If we let this extradition law pass, we will no longer have any citizen rights, any freedom of speech. Look at China. They're suffering from the freedom. They're suffering from the government. And second, to hold the same streets in central Hong Kong occupied by the Umbrella Movement five years ago. Those protests achieve almost nothing. Today, the mood feels more radical. We should fight for what we ha should have. So are you saying that peaceful protest is over? There's no more, there That's shouldn't be any peaceful it's not working. protest. It's not working. We are already having peaceful con protests here. Last Sunday, but it's no it? longer working. Police attempts to keep order seem half-hearted at first. Emboldened, the protesters push their barriers all the way up to the gates of the Legislative Council building, known as LegCo. One or two get hit with a nasty squirt of pepper spray. That stuff stings. But it's not going to deter these people. By midday, a massive crowd has effectively occupied the streets. The protesters had succeeded in keeping most of the legislators out of LegCo. Sure, 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 sure. But we managed to get in. In an upper corridor, we met Charles Mock, who supports the protesters. Down on the streets, meanwhile, it looked like it was suddenly kicking off. The demonstrators were trying to storm the building. But the protesters seem to be breaking in from two different sides here and the police have completely retreated back away from the main entrance and back into the building itself. I don't want to see this, see this kind of conflict happen, but uh, I think the government simply disappeared. This is totally irresponsible. This is also, though, irresponsible, isn't it? I mean, these people are, are using violence to storm the well, legislative I, I, council. I, I think the, uh, the, the reality is we have no choice. A lot of people here in Hong Kong see that we have no choice. We went downstairs, where the police had effectively barricaded themselves inside the building. I don't know what's going on. It's extremely chaotic. The protesters have basically broken through the outer perimeter. This is the inner perimeter where the police are holding out. They've grabbed some of the protesters, but at the moment it looks like the police are being pushed back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. An officer lies injured on the floor. He's apparently unconscious. And if being charged by protesters wasn't enough, the police now incur the wrath of the legislators. This is ridiculous. How can the police take over your parliament building? That's what they're doing right now. But the protesters' attempt to storm LegCo was a turning point. Out on the streets, the police were fighting back. By mid-afternoon, they chased the demonstrators away from LegCo and they weren't stopping there. Well, the police are trying to drive the protesters back bit by bit using tear gas. You saw that being fired right now. The air is thick with it. It's hard to breathe without one of these on. And they've really made inroads. All of this was occupied by the protesters earlier. Five years 
ago. Umbrellas were a symbol of hope here. They occupied this place for nearly three months and nothing changed. So now the umbrellas have become a symbol of defiance and of physical defence against the tear gas from the police. The protesters' attempt to occupy central Hong Kong was ending in retreat. The last time this happened, they were here for nearly three months. The police are clearly determined not to allow that to happen again. The authorities won the battle today. But these images will do little to calm fears that Hong Kong is starting to look increasingly like mainland China. Remarkable scenes. Well, Gabriel joins us now from Hong Kong. Gabriel, where does this protest go from here then? Well, Mark, the street that you see behind me just a few hours ago was a sea of protesters. And now, as you can see, there's just a few cleaners tidying up, clearing up the helmets, the gas masks, the umbrellas, uh, and a few odd policemen. So what a turnaround and what a difference from five years ago when the umbrella protesters occupied this for 79 days straight. Clearly, uh, the police weren't going to allow that to happen. But the fact that the protesters aren't here right now does not mean that they've gone away. These people, many of them very young, lots of them school children, what we found and you saw in that piece was anger. People are angry and worried about where this city is going. And I don't think that anger is going to go away. I think uh, we are likely to see more protests and probably quite soon. Now, in terms of the bill, uh, that's a different question. Uh, the uh, protesters did manage to uh, get the reading uh, cancelled today, so it didn't go through. But uh, the authorities here are going to press ahead with it. They say they're determined to, uh, and they'll probably pass the law uh, by the end of the month. Now, to be fair to them, they say there are safeguards in place uh, that uh, the Hong Kong chief executive has to approve any extraditions. It has to go um, through the Hong Kong legal process. But the protesters say, look, the relationship between Beijing and Hong Kong is not a relationship of equals. Uh, and if Beijing wants to extradite someone hard enough, it will be very hard for the authorities here to resist. And that, they say, is a huge chip off the block of the arrangement of one country, two systems, which is the system that Britain and China agreed in 1997, or rather in the 1980s under Thatcher, and signed in 1997 uh, during the handover. And many people here feel that Britain in particular made a promise to them, a promise to try to uphold that system, one country, two systems, and that that's a promise that they are not now fulfilling. Gabriel, thank you. Well, we're joined now by Ambassador Liu Xiaoming, who's been Chinese ambassador to the UK since 2009, quite a period. Ambassador, let's start off with the joint declaration, that treaty between the two countries. Is China still committed to upholding it? We are upholding the principle of one country, two systems. This promise has been made not only to uh, Britain, but to the world, to the Chinese people in, and the people including uh, uh, inclu uh, people including those in Hong Kong. Uh, the uh, jo uh, joint declaration has completed its mission of the Hong Kong handover and uh, uh, now um, I think the one country, two system has been successful well, uh, in Hong Kong. You say it's completed its mission and I want to put to you something your foreign ministry spokesman Liu Kang said two years ago this summer, pretty much this time. He said that the uh, declaration no longer has any realistic meaning. It's a purely historic um, document. I think it's a historic document. It uh, completed the mission to ensure a smooth handover So it's irrelevant Hong Kong. now? Or? It's relevant in that it set a good example for the international community to settle a dispute between nations by peaceful means. So it is still a shining, successful example for people to follow. But that declaration gives the British government no sovereignty, no right, no any legitimacy to interfere into the internal affairs of Hong Kong. Well, Hong Kong no sovereignty, that's clear. That's what ended in 1997, yes, but still an interest and a feeling on the part of hundreds of thousands of people in Hong Kong that Britain has a duty 
to protect their rights under the terms of that promise. The British government have a duty to protect your own citizens, but not the people of Hong Kong. The, the citizens of Hong Kong people, uh, you know, they are uh, part of China now, Hong Kong. And the, uh, you know, according to basic law, uh, Hong Kong people will run their own affairs. And, uh, you know, they are entitled to implement their social system different from the mainland but it has nothing to do with the British government. But I'm sure you can see, um, putting the British government to one side now, just the feelings of the people in Hong Kong. Hundreds of thousands, some people say 10% of the entire population have come out on the streets. A nerve has been touched that Beijing is not respecting um, their right to a separate system, a separate that, judicial that's, system. That's not correct. I think the whole st story has been distorted this story, this case, is about to rectify the deficiencies, plug the loopholes of the existing legal system. Who's distorting this, do you think? The media? Well, in and Hong also, Kong, oh, I saw... No, 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 including BBC, I think. You know, you, you, you portrayed the story as uh, the Hong Kong government uh, made this amendment and the instruction uh, uh, of a Beijing government. As a matter of fact, Beijing, the central government, gave no instruction, no order about the making amendment. This amendment was initiated by the Hong Kong government. It's prompted by a murder case happened in Taiwan. And this would is you, would, sorry, excuse me, would you advise the Hong Kong government then to drop it? given we're how fully controversial. No, we're fully how controversial. Why should we ask them to drop? Because well, we, you can we, see we, what people, even legislators no. there, one man said you're beating the people out of Hong Kong to the police. That's, that's the scenes we're seeing in the territory now as a result of this attempt but to change the law. But you have to remember, uh, it, it, at the very beginning, it has been peaceful demonstration, but it became ugly afterwards. Policeman was beaten. And the police have to defend themselves. They have to put a order in place. So you can't uh, blame policemen. I think that also always the forces inside, outside Hong Kong try to take advantage of things to stir up trouble. Uh, let me come back to this. But this uh, is a domestic. Uh, this is a domestic grassroots movement of people in Hong Kong. But you it's only, uh, you know, it had been. Uh, 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 it, it, it is exaggerated to one million. As a matter of fact, according to police account, it's about 200,000 people. But you yeah, ignore 800,000 people who sign up to support the amendment. This a silent majority has not been fully reported in this country by the BBC. Well, you're, you're, making, also, you're making the case now. And so also the Hong Kong government invites uh, uh, the Hong Kong public for suggestions for opinion and they received 4,500 written uh, reply. 3,000 su support the amendment, only 1,500 oppose amendment. What so effect, sorry, but I, I will just want to move on to one or two other issues. What effect do you think it has on people in Hong Kong when they see treatment of Uyghurs, for example, in the eastern region of Xinjiang? An estimated one million people, Muslim no. minority citizens, Again, you're in exactly re-education re I don't know where you get this one million people. You know, uh, the U, are, well, it's a UN the, estimate. There are, uh, I don't think it's a UN has any report uh, 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 on this. Uh, there are education center, uh, uh, education uh, you know, training center. It's for help the people who have been uh, brainwashed by extremists to return to society, uh, to return uh, uh, and to earn their uh, living, uh, to train them with the skill, language, and the, uh, 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 the knowledge of legal, so they can protect their own interests. You know, can, we, can we have access? Can we see what's going course, on? Because a lot of, course, of people... We, we invited the journalists and the diplomats to visit the But we uh, the keep center. hearing reports that what, what happens in there is an assault on their Muslim faith. And that, no, that, no, that, that's a completely wrong. That they're forced to eat you know, pork, that they're prevented from praying, no. that they're told it's a backward religion. Th this all distortion. This is all made up news, fake news, I would say. You know, people well, are respected. We're getting it through they reliable are respected sources. for their freedom of religion. 
you know, the, the people are entitled to have their religion. And, and the people, you know, the important thing, you miss the big picture, is the reason for this center is to educate those young people who have been, you know, intoxicated by the extreme ideas. And ever since uh, these measures, there have been no extre extremist uh, violent uh, incident in Xinjiang for the past three years. No, that, I think that means this measure have been successful. I think anyone would understand why you might want de-radicalization or to prevent terrorist acts. I think that's a, a, a cause that you might have in common with many other governments or societies around the world. But what we hear persistent reports of is a very large number of people, up to a million, no. involved in this re-education process, which sounds this, frankly uh, sinister. I don't think why you get this uh, number, one million, and, and uh, I, you, How, if you what, talk, what would your estimate be? If, if, you know, it's a, it's a difficult to calculate number because there's a, a going, uh, coming in, going out. You know, it's a, it's, it's a, a number changed from time to time. But the important thing you have to focus on, the purpose of this centre, is not, you know, to round up people. The purpose is to help these young people to have a better life and after, you know, education and training. And you're saying that the purpose is not to eradicate Islam as a religion among those people, that that is not the aim of this exercise? No, no, not at all. Huawei. Uh, it's a big subject, and I'm sure for you, in your post in London, uh, it's something you care a lot about. Uh, the British government has been in a position where it seemed to make an interim decision on advice uh, to use some elements of uh, Huawei's technology in its 5G network. Now, as you know, quite a bit of pressure from the United States not to do so at all. Will there be consequences, do you think, from a Chinese point of view, if Britain decides not to use it at all? First of all, I would say Huawei is a good company, is a leader in 5G. You know, they are here for win-win cooperation with the British counterparts, and they contribute tremendously, not only to telecom industry in this country. Uh, they employ 7,000 people, and also they, I think uh, it, it, you know, in terms of win-win collaboration, if UK collaborate with Huawei, there'll be promising future. Well, both sides. They've got advanced technology, no doubt about it. But what if the UK chooses not to? I what, think what will it, that was sent, to? it was sent a very bad message, uh, not only to Huawei, but also to Chinese businesses. Why the UK will remain open? Well, UK will be still business friendly uh, environment for Chinese company. It will send a very bad signal. Negative effects on yes, trade. Yes, bad, bad, yes. On, not only on trade, but also on investment. For, for the past three, for the past five years, the investment from China exceed the total investment in the previous 30 years. So Chinese investment uh, are booming in this country. In the last year, increased by 14 percent. But if you shut the door for Huawei, it will send very bad and negative message to other Chinese businesses. On that note, Ambassador, thank you very much for joining us.